Hey everybody, welcome to Talks at Google. Is everybody excited to see Lindsay? Well, um, just as a little introduction in case people aren't know who Lindsay is, she has over a billion views on YouTube. Um, she was just, we're here for the book, right? It is now a New York Times top 10 bestseller. Yeah? And with no further ado, we want to welcome Lindsay Sterling up on the stage. Welcome, hey. Lindsay. Hi. Hey. Aha. Thank you, guys, for the warm welcome and the nice remarks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well, it's kind of like welcome home. I mean, welcome back to Google. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I owe all my success to this platform that has been, cre been created by Google. And so this is like home for me, I guess. So tell us, so we're here about uh, your new book, The Only Pirate at the Party, mm -hmm. which is a lovely title. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you, I guess, first take us back to violin and mm -hmm. talk to us about like how you started violin and when you knew music is something you wanted to do. So I started the violin when I was six years old, and it was because my parents, they used to play classical music on this old record player in our house all the time, and they would take us to orchestra concerts in, in LA at the time was where we lived. And I just, I noticed that the violinists, they got all the solos, they got to, you know, they got to play the fast, interesting parts, and so I started begging my parents for lessons when I was tiny. And, um, started when I was six, and it was always something I loved and something that I, you know, I always kind of saw it as like, you know, a glorified hobby. Like I went to college actually for something completely different, um, just because I always wanted to keep it my hobby. I was always wanted to love music. I never wanted to like resent it. And then when I was sitting in class in college, all I could think about was music. And you know, I'm studying. I was studying to be a therapist, and I was like spending all my free time at open mic nights and with bands. And I just realized I'm always going to regret this if I don't if I don't chase after this. I have to give it a try. And thank heavens I did. <laughs> Worked out all, all right, I think. Um, so you talked about your parents briefly in there. Can you tell us a little bit more about? And you say this in your book about your parents and the influence they had on you younger and, and kind of that motivation. Yeah. Um, my parents were always so, like, so supportive of me and my sisters, all of us expressing ourselves and expressing our creativity. And whether it was my mom teaching me how to sew or them encouraging me to pursue music or um, my dad would, he was a writer and he would read, a, read us as bedtime stories, scripts that he had written when he was like, you know, trying to make it in the movie business. And, um, you know, so I just grew up kind of with this idea that creativity is, is life and creativity is, is, is therapeutic, it's everything, it's, it's fun, it's joyous. And so, and also I think the fact that my dad chased his dream when he was, he was young and he told, had all these stories about going places and meeting people and shaking their hands. And I remember I'd tell my dad, even when I was tiny, dad, I wanna live a life like you. Like, I wanna go places, I wanna shake people's hands. And I think I attribute a lot of where I'm at today because my dad chased his dreams and even though it almost gave me more courage to chase them because he felt like he was better. Even though he didn't get his necessarily at the time he was chasing them, he still had all these amazing stories um, and was better for it. And so I was like, well, you know, I guess even for trying, you know, it's, it's okay to try and not get exactly to where you want because you'll get somewhere. Yeah. So your family has a writing gene. It does. Okay. Um, I'm in a family of like literary writers. Like my parents were both English majors. My sister Brooke wrote my book with me, or she, you know, was the writer of the book. And so. <laughs> <laughs> and Brooke, give us a wave. You're going to come up yeah, here a little Brooke's later and there. talk further. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I can't steal the credit because she's in the room. <laughs> Just kidding. So, um, what are your thoughts on? Like a lot of YouTubers are writing books. Um, was that kind of a motivation for you as well, or what are your thoughts on that? Actually, we started the book three years ago, and I'm sure they all started theirs like um, you know years before. We all probably were working on them silently at the same time, and I think it's really awesome that 
like my YouTube friends, they're my peers. Like we all kind of started together in this weird world of YouTube where we were like kind of the rejects of the entertainment industry. We were seen as like, oh, it's a, yeah, they're not a big, they're YouTubers. Like <laughs> we're like the freak category. And so it's so cool to see these people that are my friends. We've all kind of, we're like a little sorority that's all grown up together. And to see like Grace, you know, on get a show on TV and then to see Miranda on Jimmy Fallon and do, you know, writing a book and just everybody doing these amazing things and winning awards it's like we're it's like go team internet we're a family and so it's really exciting and we all have each other's books like we send them to each other and like I don't know it's, it's a family awesome and so within your book um, <clears throat> I mean what was your main motivation uh, I guess to start out and think you know I've had this amazing career let's write a book talk a little bit further about it yeah, well, I wanted it to be several things. I wanted people to read it and laugh and enjoy it and have like a, a you know, like, ugh, like be filled with positivity. But at the same time, I think one of the big motivations to write the book was I felt like I had some experiences and stories that I wanted to share because here in, in meet and greets and at shows, people will, you know, ask me questions and I've, you know, it's a very quick process at a meet and greet. You don't get to spend like an hour ch chatting with someone and, you know, girls would whisper to me like, I, I struggle with anorexia and like, how did you get through it? And what do you say to someone in that moment? And so, you know, it just made me think over and over again, gosh, when I was going through depression and anorexia, I felt so isolated and so alone. And people are very afraid to talk about those kind of things. And um, it took me a really long time to even realize I had a problem because I thought, no, depression, I don't, I don't have that. Like, <laughs> that's not me. Um, but the thing is, I think that this is something that a lot of people unknowingly or knowingly go through. And so I wanted to bring awareness to it and also provide hopefully hope for someone that like when I felt hopeless, hopefully they can find hope and realize that they can get through it and you know, they can be who they want to be. Yeah. Now you have a chapter called life with Ed. Mm, yeah. um, do you mind talking a little bit more about the title of that and yeah. kind of that experience? Totally. Um, so life without Ed is a, is a book that I read when I was struggling with anorexia and it was probably one of the most helpful books that I, that I read. I read a lot about um, anorexia when I realized I had a problem and it was a book where it separated the eating disorder and this girl, her therapist had taught her to call her eating disorder Ed. And so the, for the first time I realized, oh my gosh, my eating disorder isn't me. It's not my brain. This is, this is something that has come into me and it's something that I can get out. It's a separate part of my brain that I can say, go away. And so in this book, she talks to her eating disorder and she calls it Ed and she personifies it. And so these voices that would come into her head telling her negative things and telling her that she was worthless or that, you know, um, whatever, she would talk back to this voice with the other side of her brain and say, no, I'm not worthless, you know, and she would have these conversations. And as much as it sounds schizophrenic and multiple personality disorder, <laughs> I did this. And um, I bas it allowed me to feel like I had the ability to take control over my brain again and kick out this very unhealthy part of myself. And, you know, it's still there. It's still like a little part of me that will always be there, but I know how to talk to it now. And it, it actually hides most of the time. It's usually not there. And, you know, when I first learned about an eating disorder and I st first started researching it, I was so upset because I read that it's an incurable disease. Mm. And I was like, who wants to hear that, like, the worst part of yourself is incurable and you're always going to have it. And now I understand why they say that, but at the same time, it's not a part of my everyday life. It's not a part of my weekly life. When I get really stressed out, Ed starts to come back and I've learned, I know how to talk to it and tell it to go away. And so that's why I wanted that chapter to be in there because I wanted to express that like, it is curable. You can get rid of it. You can kick things out of your life and you can determine who you want to be and you don't have to let you know, the hard things we go through determine who we are. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, in that same experience, opening up about that, I mean, you're a great role model for other people. Do you, do you mind talking a little bit about your core principles um, and, and that influence on your life? Yeah. You know, I, a lot of people ask me, like, oh, how do you try to stay grounded or how do you, you know, my life has literally like flipped upside down in the last like four years. I'm, I'm in a completely different place than I ever thought I would ever be in. And, you know, everything from my personal life to my, you know, my professional life has just changed. And the one thing I think that's kept me very consistent is two things. It's my family and my, my spiritual beliefs, my religious beliefs. Um, you know, and I was raised in a very, a very, um, 
you know, we were a very religious family. We went to church every week, and, and we had specific principles and guidelines. And I decided when I started to kind of see my career taking off, it kind of scared me. And I thought, like, what if I change? Like, what if I, like, I'm, I like the person that I am. I like Lindsay, the core of, like, the person that my parents have raised me to be. And, um, I'm, and I don't want to become something I'm not. I don't want to become scary. You know, you hear about people change and, you know, Justin Bieber fell off the deep end. And you're like, ah, like, what do I do? And so I made a decision that, you know, and it was almost like a promise to me and God. And some people, you know, call it, I think most people that are artistic have a belief in something greater than themselves. And to me, it's God. And I made a promise to God that I would stay true to the principles that I had right then, you know, the way I, my standards of dress, my standards of, of lifestyle and my spirituality. And as long as I kept, I've kept that in the forefront of my life and kind of a foundation, as much as everything else has changed, my religious beliefs and my family have kind of kept me feeling like I'm the same Lindsay that, that I have grown up to be and that I, I want to stay. And, um, and I, I plan to keep that as a foundation of my life. And it's, I think it's kept me sane. <laughs> yeah. There's a funny chapter in your book. Um, this is the only spoiler alert I'll give. Uh, but it's where you say the chapter on like drugs and rock and roll and everything. And then it's like one sentence, and it's like, I didn't do any of that, so moving on. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that was, that was a good chapter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was the easiest in the audio book. When I got to that, it was like, chapter down. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, do you mind talking a little bit about the chapter, No Man's Land? I think it kind of starts leading up to the title yeah. and everything. But. Yeah. You know, there was a, another theme that I wanted to bring up in the book is that it's OK to be different. And a lot of times, one of the first chapters in the book says that sometimes being different feels a lot like being alone. And it's not like I've gone through my life being like, I want to like look different, and I want to be different, and I want to be quirky and weird, and have you know stand out. You know, and a lot of times, like um, I just feel like every single person is different when we're true to our authentic selves. And that's OK. Um, it's, life isn't about, or acceptance is very different from fitting in. Fitting in is changing yourself to fit what someone else wants you to be. And acceptance is being accepted by those you love for who you really are. And so No Man's Land was a chapter where I talked about how sometimes I feel like I'm in the middle of two very different worlds. Like there's my religious side and the side where I want, like I, I like to be frugal and I drive the same car I you know, drove in high school. And like there's that side of myself. Um, and then there's this. You really drive the same car since the high school? Well, actually, in the book I do. I, my car died a couple I know, months I, ago. I thought um, it had died, so I thought it made <laughs> And I was very sad about it. it. It died on the 405, and I just sat there on the side of the road. It was the third time it died in a month, and I was like, we're done. We're done. <laughs> we're done. So, but when the book was completed, yeah. I had the same, so it's a lie. It's a, no, no. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so there's that side of myself, and then there's the side of myself that, you know, I'm in the music industry, and, you know, I'm in, you know, the, a lot of that industry sometimes falls in the, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Not everybody, but that's kind of the stigma of, of a lot of what you come you know, into contact with, and I f feel sometimes like I toe the line of two very different worlds, and I'm in the middle, and Either side, a lot of times, can't understand the other. Um, but at the end of the chapter, it also talks about how you know it's okay. And like my my tour manager writes me this letter that I realize, yeah, sometimes maybe I do feel like I'm in no man's land. But there are people that understand me, and there are people that I've surrounded myself with that get it and and love that about me and and respect it. And so I've just learned over and over again, even in these times when I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm alone. There are like there are always people that that's why they love you is for the things that make you different. And no one's really in no man's land. Wow. Um, so like YouTube being your main platform, um, you write about this, but it's a very public platform, right? That you can comment, people can comment, you can see that. Um, tell us about how when you first started getting really big on YouTube, how you dealt with maybe the comments, or the <clears throat> good, the bad, and, and how you went through that. Yes. Um, <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I, I have some friends, you know, that are YouTubers that say, oh, you get used to the comments. You know, it's like, oh, you know, you just kind of like ignore them and it doesn't matter at some point. But for maybe I'm different, but I feel like the hurtful comments, that, you know, they're always going to hurt a little bit, especially when they kind of hit you in that spot that you're sensitive to, that you're like, ooh, I was hoping nobody would comment on that, you know? <laughs> Everybody has their little things. Like, I don't know if any of you watch The Bachelor, but the gal was talking about her toes, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, she started crying, right? She starts crying yeah. about her toes. Not that I watch it, but my wife. <laughs> Sorry. Gotcha. Your Dang. wife, right? Yeah, yeah, Your wife. Yeah. Anyways, I thought that was hilarious, but <laughs> that's a side note. Um, but yeah, everybody has their things that are just like, oh my gosh, not that. And I, but you learn that there is so much more good than there is ever bad. Like there's like a 
ton of like really positive comments and then there's one that may be really nasty, but it's like, why is it that we let the bad stick out so much more than the good? Um, <clears throat> and so it's, it's just trying to refocus. You know, because you know, there's always different places of your mind where you can go, but there's one stage, and it's things come in and out, thoughts come in and out all the time, and it's what thoughts are you going to entertain, what thoughts are you going to let stay on the stage of your mind, and which ones are you going to kick off really fast. And so it's, I've learned to just, you know, you take it all with a grain of salt, you move, it, you move on, and focus, try to focus on the good. And especially as you get bigger and bigger as a YouTuber, you get more and more of your fans, and now I have my little Sterlingites, and they will defend <laughs> me to the death. And you know, that like, if there's a negative comment, like, I, you know, I usually don't see it, because they'll, they like defend me so hardcore. <laughs> How dare you say that Lindsay's hair looks messy, you know, whatever it is. So I would like to invite your sister Brooke up, if you don't mind, Woo! we can invite Brooke up. <laughs> Brooke, Brooke, Brooke. <laughs> Thank you. Well, welcome, Brooke, to the stage. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. I would love to talk to both of you a little bit about um, writing this book. Now, I know it took a few years, but how was it tour life and the balance and writing this book together? Just if you mind talking a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, it was kind of difficult at first because she's, you know, traveling around the world and we don't live in the same state in general. Um, so we did a lot of it over Skype almost, I'd say like 90% of the book was written via Skype. So we would just try to time, find times and she's like in a completely different time zone. So I'd st get up really early and she'd stay up, you know, at, late after a show and we'd Skype at really weird times. Or Google Plus occasionally, you know, Google <laughs> oh. Hangouts. Actually, yes. It's part of the choice. No big actually, I'm joking. We actually did because yeah. it depended in different countries. True. One would be stronger than the yeah, other. Yeah, like Skype is not working. Let's go to Gchat. <laughs> yeah, it was, so there you go. Okay, okay, good. Our little plug yeah, saying that. Good, good. <laughs> the superior platform, yeah. if you know what I mean. <laughs> But it was funny. I remember a lot, like several nights we're both really tired and and we're like, I can't understand you. Like it's all broken up. Uh, 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 uh. I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. I got it. Just move yeah. on. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about. Um, again, you talk a lot about your relationship and everything. Um, tell us a little bit more about that and how it developed, and especially as you started touring more, doing more, um, how you kept that intact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brooke and I have been like. We shared a room as kids. We were best buddies. Um, we were roommates in college. She's come on tour with me. So Brooke, it was it was great to have her write the book because she's been there through almost every like stage of my life and seen it firsthand, seen known the people. Um, but it, it talks about in the book how like there was a time like a relationship kind of is throughout the book and you see that there's a time when we kind of lost that a little bit and it was when I was going through my eating disorder and I kind of lost sight of everything and our relationship was probably the biggest loss that I had from my eating disorder um, when we became like strangers basically. And we were living together in the same room and somehow we just totally drifted and we didn't even know each other anymore. So um, yeah, writing the book was actually really cool, but by the time she asked me to write it, we had kind of mended that a little bit. Um, but the process of writing it was really, really cool because it was almost like a healing for the both of us at the same time because we got to work together and just kind of relive all that and go through it. And it's yeah. been really, really cool, so. The good and the bad. Yeah. I remember we both like cried yeah, when we read the like chapter. We're like, oh, this is so good. <laughs> oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> Yeah, and this, is this your first book? It is. It's wow. my first book. Yeah, not bad. New York Times best <laughs> I know, she's the best selling author. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, so, we would love to take some questions from the crowd if you have any, and we'll have some microphones that we pass around. I want to talk to you a little bit about college, and you're graduating soon, right? <gasps> I graduated yeah, this did. last fall. Last fall, that's great. <laughs> I did, I'm a graduate. That's right. So, I was working on my internship, like, because I left school right when I, all I had You had left, to do an internship? All I had left was an internship, <laughs> and they awesome. were, they would not let me graduate without it, so I was like, oh, so I was like doing little internship projects while I was on my last tour, you know, kind of for the last year, and, uh. What did you do for your internship? So I was, <laughs> I'm now a, rec a recreation management uh, therapist, yes. um, everyone, but, uh, so for my internship, I had wanted to work with at-risk youth, and so I would have treatment centers, uh, bring out their their youth or I'd go speak to them at, you know on tour days or I'd come have them come out and come to sound check and I would like do a little speech and talk to them and answer their questions and so that's kind of how I did my internship 
And it was really fun. That's awesome. And it was funny. I was at graduation and like wearing the cap and gown and everything, like super excited. And I was at BYU and all these people were like whispering in front of me. And then someone like kind of like tugged on my little <laughs> cap and they're like, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm graduating. Like, I'm not wearing this for style points. You're just going like, to bust it out and start playing violin like, or something. Music video or something. Yeah, they're like, is it like a, yeah, an impromptu music video? <laughs> Yes, yes, I wanted the cap and gown. So why was it important for you, though? I mean, obviously, you're well-established in your career and doing well, but um, why still graduate? You know, I worked so hard. I put myself through college. I worked really hard to, you know, work a day job, go to school, and, like, pursue music. And, and it was something my entire life I always knew I would graduate. I always knew I would have a degree. And, and also, it was something I believed in. Like, I, I really did want to become a recreational therapist. And, um, and so it was just... I couldn't live with the fact that I was so close and I had something that was so important to me that I never finished. And so I was like, I will get that degree. And everyone told me also, I always get inspired and motivated when people say I won't do something and everyone's like, oh, you'll never come back. And I was like, yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. I'll get that degree. And <laughs> yeah, we saw that with America's Got Talent, right? That's There's, right. Yeah, I, will, I will come back yeah. and you'll invite me. <laughs> <laughs> you will like it. You will love it. That's awesome. Um, so we have a question from the crowd. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the transition from classical to mm. not classical and how that happened. So I was, <laughs> I was uh, classically trained as a piano player and then became a computer programmer, which is a little bit different as well. That's I, but a, that's it, quite it's a actually transition. not too uncommon. I think a lot of us here do that. Uh, but I want to hear about classic violin to, to your style. Yes. Um, so I'm very grateful that I was classically trained because, you know, those chops as a classical musician, they're kind of... I mean, that's important stuff. That's kind of the foundation of, of my playing. But um, I just got really burnt out. And I remember it was right before I went to college, and I was trying to decide whether I wanted to study music or not. Like I said, I was trying to keep it fun. But I was like, I don't enjoy this anymore. Like, I don't, I don't love it, and I used to love it. And that made me really sad. And so it just clicked in my head, like, well, I need to play the kind of music I like to listen to. And so I started jamming with stuff on the radio, and I started to play with bands and write my own music. And, you know, just kind of really started to take music into my hands rather than just molding into what the violin was supposed to be. <clears throat> and uh, my passion just got reinvigorated, and it became more and more fun, and I started, like, moving to music. It looked really awkward at first. Um, and then it just kind of evolved from there where I, I found kind of my sound. And that's when I started. I was like, I'm going to make an album with this weird random sound. And it, and it turned out, I guess, really great. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> yeah. And you said you would like dance, you'd like literally practice dancing and playing in front of your roommates, right? <gasps> Yes, yes. Um, she, I can't believe it. Yeah, you, she actually used their bedroom to practice because ours was too messy. Oh, I didn't know you were going to say that. I don't know if that's in the book, so that's a good tidbit. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Oh, good times. Good times. Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, thank you so much for coming today. So I have a question. So you mentioned that f your faith really helps you to when you were sick at the time. So um, would you please elaborate more and in what specific way? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had been, you know, brought up my whole life to believe that I was a daughter of God and that he created me and he loved me and thought, you know, and anything that you create, you know, we think is beautiful. Like our own, you know, if you have a child, you think it's beautiful. I'm a new mother of a dog. I think she's beautiful. <laughs> um, but, you know, anyways, but anything that's, that you are a parent of, you love. And so I really had to kind of delve back into that. And at this time when I felt unlovable and I felt ugly and I just thought I was worthless, I had to kind of remember that I'm a child of God and I had to rely on that, that he loves me, he thinks I'm beautiful and I need to, I need to love myself so that I can go out and, because you can't love anyone else, you can't give any energy to someone else unless you first are okay with who you are. And so I had to heal myself so that I could go out and be the kind of person that God wanted me to be. Hi. I'm Ian. I, um, I just want to say I'm a huge fan, and I'm, a, I'm actually a figure skater, and I just want to, I don't know if you know, but there's a huge following for you in the figure skating community where a lot of skaters are using some of your music for no way. their numbers, um, primarily uh, crystallized and That's elements. Awesome. I'm actually nice. working on trying to do something with anti-gravity. Oh, really? But That's cool. Yeah, it's, it's really different. But um, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you mentioned uh, something earlier about uh, the music industry, and um, I'm kind of curious, uh, when you started creating your album, was there any pressure in terms of the direction that some of the songs had to be created? Was there a compromise that had to be done? Or is this everything was organic and it was, it was like, this is what I want and right. nobody <coughs> tell me what to do? Yeah. Um, well, it was, it was kind of 
at the time, my biggest, like, I was so disappointed I could not get a record label. And I didn't understand much about the music industry, but in my mind, how it worked was you had to get a record label if anyone was going to hear your tunes. And then, luckily, right before, you know, while this was going on, I discovered the wonderful land of YouTube um, and realized, oh my gosh, I don't, because I kept hearing, you're just too different. Like, people wanted to put me in a box of what was successful, and they're like, you're way out there, and this is what we know will work, and you're like, way over there. <laughs> and so, people were trying to get me to compromise my music in the weirdest ways, ways that I was like, that would never work for me, you know, that's not who I am. And so, I kept kind of just waiting, and I, start, I just kept writing, waiting, hopefully, for someone to love what I was writing. Um, and then, like I said, I discovered YouTube, and I was so excited because I realized very quickly that here is a land where I can make my music on my own, like my own way. I can do it on my own timing. I can do it the way I want. And there's people that want to hear it. Like I don't have to wait for someone to tell me I'm good enough because the, all these people are clicking on the links and they're they're liking it. And I could see the iTunes sales spiking every time I'd release a video. And so, no, it was all just kind of the music I wanted to create, and you know, my my fans told me they liked it and it was and, and that's the kind of cool thing you realize on the internet there's a niche for everything and so like what you create like create it and they will come you know it's that kind of <laughs> thing the, what are the sterlingites is that my, yes is? the sterlingites Sterling they, sorry. they called that's what i didn't make them that they made themselves that. okay <laughs> uh, another question back here so there's also the unfortunate niche of people who want to say terrible things on the internet and you mentioned this a little bit but i'm curious uh being on the receiving end not a, a lot of us are on the receiving end as much as you are probably of all kinds of comments. Um, first of all, why do you think they do that? But secondly and more importantly, um, what can we do as just humans to, to help the problem? What can we do as Google to help the problem? In your opinion, like, mm. what can be done about this? Because it's pretty, it's pretty terrible and sometimes it makes me ashamed to be a human. <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, you know, with this new age of like this extreme amount of technology, um, I just think human actions have become less, per or human interactions have become less important and less precious. And people feel like just because they don't have a face to that comment, you know, just because they have a picture of like you know a Pokemon character as their icon, <laughs> and their name is like Skittles twenty seven, like it's okay <laughs> to say really mean things because there's like no accountability for it. And so that's why I think people are, you know, and also I've just realized people want to be heard. Like everyone wants to feel like they have a voice. Like people are craving connection and I think the more this like digital age takes off, people crave it more and more. This, this like wanting to have an identity, wanting to be noticed, wanting to be heard. And so I think that's why a lot of people will say really nasty things. It's because, and then, you know, when people like my old Sterlingites defend, you know, it's like that's what they want. They want to fight and get that interaction. Um, but I think I've just thought a lot about this lately, even in stores, like when I'm checking out at, at um, Walgreens, like how often am I on my phone and not even like looking at the person that's helping me? And you know, and I like, they ask like, do you want to donate a dollar? I'm like, you know, sure. You know, or, well, you know, you don't even like look up at people anymore half the time. And so I've, I've tried to make a conscious effort in, in my interactions, whether it's online to be personal with people or whether it's in person to actually like look people in the eye and say, how was your day? You know, it's it just, I think we're all craving connection and s people reach out in weird ways sometimes for it. Uh, if you could do a collaboration with any other artist, past or present, live or dead, who would you pick and why? Live or dead? <laughs> well, that's so hard. Um, Okay, I've got I've got two that are dead that are one of them is like a no-brainer. Michael Jackson, oh my yeah. gosh. I would have him give me a dance tutorial and we would do a remake of Beat It. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> and then also my other one, I would love to like do a comedy sketch with Lucille Ball. <laughs> I love Lucille Ball. She's like my hero. <laughs> huh. What about Very you, Brooke? Cool. Well, I'm nobody. I don't like being in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> We're like the same, but really different. It's really, <laughs> it's really funny. Okay. That's awesome. Um, another question? This question is actually coming more from my mother, who uh, has actually been a violin teacher for 40 years now. Wow. And uh, she has very much fallen in love with your music. And uh, also her students have as well. And uh, so she wants to thank you for that, first of all, for motivating a lot of very young people uh, to basically increase their motivation to learn how to play the violin and to actually, you know, continue to want to do that. Um, the, and, uh, you know, it's really fun to watch 
her play that along with her students at like old folks' homes and different places. Um, watch the old folks get up and start dancing and things like that. Um, but uh, the question that uh, she has is she's been taking a lot of your arrangements and your pieces and kind of like trying to simplify them a little bit so that oh. younger people can play them. And uh, so the question is, is that something that you've considered doing if you considered making, um, because a lot of your pieces are very difficult. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> so that's the question is, have you ever considered creating even simpler versions of the music that you have? You know, that's such a good, I have, I, I want to make a violin tutorial method, you know, like a, a series of books. Um, so there's pretty much one out there, there's pretty much like one method that everybody uses. So I wanted to make, you know, not to replace it, but to be a supplement to that method um, and intersperse my songs along with classical violin songs, you know, um, and yeah, simplify some of them. I have not done it yet, but, um, but it's definitely something that I really wanted to do. So it's on my, it's on my list. <laughs> I'm wondering what, what's the good and bad of moving from what you were doing to, to getting professional management? The, oh, um, well, it's been all, it's been very great. Um, because, <laughs> so when I started, I was doing literally everything myself from, um, you know, the thinking of the video ideas and the creative side that I still do and still love to do, but I was also, anytime someone ordered a piece of merchandise, I was the one that rolled up the poster, stuck it in an envelope, wrote a thank you note, and like stuck it in there, went to the post office and mailed it. Like I did everything. Um, and it was over, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't focus, I stopped being able to focus on the creative and I was starting to just kind of run dry of ideas because I was so overwhelmed. And so, you know, getting with a management company that, and it was actually a really cool process because when I was searching for management, I was very much like, you know, don't try to change me, you know, I'm, I'm the way I am, I like to be very hands-on, and also, you know, YouTube is the base, I don't want a record label, you know, and so I was looking for somebody that could take who I was and then just add their, their knowledge of the actual real music industry and how it works, and so it's been this amazing thing where, you know, we've kind of learned from each other. I found the right management company, um, my manager's right back there in the back, Adina, give a wave. Yeah, hey. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say the, the hard thing about it is just finding the right manager was really hard. I was, I was managerless for quite a while because I was searching for the right fit. It's like dating, you know? <laughs> it's like looking, you know, because you're just, I felt like I was going on all these dates with management companies and meetings. And then finally, you know, when you find the right people, it clicks and it's been amazing. But yeah, that process was exhausting. Um, I know you've worked with an old friend of mine, uh, Devin Graham. Um, I went to, went to high school with him. Um, we shot a video together. But, um, nice. Um, and I know you've worked with him. Uh, you, I think you still do. Um, your latest Final Fantasy video, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you also had a relationship with him for a good while. Um, how has... Sorry. <laughs> just throw that one in there. Yeah, just, yes. you, you dated him in case you didn't yeah. get another yeah. um, <laughs> But I know... Yeah, I know. It's not there anymore. But, um, but you're still working. You're still working with him after the fact. And I just wanted to know how, uh, having worked with him, how like easygoing or um, was it difficult to work with other, like other celebrities, like YouTubers, like you're saying, you have many friends who are YouTubers. Uh, how was it working and having a relationship with one um, affect uh, your career? Yeah. Yes. Um, it was. I actually met Devin. He's the one that introduced me to the YouTube world. He contacted me. He saw like this little video I had, um, and he's, he's. It was my America's Got Talent video. He saw, and he reached out to me and was like, "I think you would do really well on YouTube." And I was just like, "I didn't understand." I was like, "YouTube, I don't get it," you know. And so he actually taught this. He he used to teach classes on like kind of, here's YouTube. Be introduced to the land of YouTube. This is how you be a YouTuber. And I went to one of his classes. He invited me, and I was like, wow, what? And my life was like changed in that moment. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And so I owe so much to Devin Graham, because not only that, you know, we started working together a ton. We started dating. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it was, it was amazing. It was, you know, the two of us were chasing our dreams together, and we were getting to travel the world together, and both doing what we loved, and we would help each other with our projects which was amazing and really hard to end a relationship though that's based on everything. Like we were each other's best friends, we were dating, we were also like each other's coworkers pretty much. We did everything together. And so I remember thinking my career was over when, I, when we ended it. I was like, okay, that was the worst decision I ever made. <laughs> like, I'm, like I didn't know how I was gonna continue because he was my cinematographer, he was my partner in crime. And um, so it was really interesting to kind of re-navigate the waters of how do I do this? Like, 
you know, without the guy that taught me everything I know and has helped me every step of the way so far. And so it was, but like I said, I owe everything pretty much that I have to what Devin Graham did for me, and he's an amazing person. So here's the Devin Super Tramp. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for Lindsay Sterling? What's next? Um, you know, this book is what's been next for so long, so yeah. it's crazy that now it's out. And uh, now I'm working on an album, and I'm really excited about it. I'm about halfway done with it, and it's going to come out um, in June. Fingers crossed. It's my, my self-proclaimed deadline. Um, but yeah, and I'm, I'm super stoked about that. We'll be touring and doing festivals um, through the summer and touring in the fall. So that's pretty much what's next for me. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Lindsay. This is amazing. Yeah, thank you. guys, thank you so much for watching today and joining us. I also wanted to talk a little bit about a charity that I support. It's called Operation Underground Railroad and it deals with human trafficking and this group goes in and they save kids from human trafficking and slavery. And it's a huge issue today that a lot of us don't like to talk about and it's amazing, it saves lives. So you can click the upper right hand corner to donate and also to find out more about it. Thanks guys.